Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and for this two-part lesson, you will be learning about transplants. During this lesson, which is part one, you will be learning about different types of transplants, common tissues and organs that are transplanted, and the medical complications that can arise from organ and tissue transplants. So let's start as we always do with a question. In this case, what is an organ transplant? And I mean, of course, as the name implies, it probably means that you're transferring an organ from one person to another. But it is not just a transfer of an organ from one body to another. It can also involve the transfer of body tissues and sometimes not actually from one body to another, but even from one part of a patient's body to another part of the same patient's body. So we're going to be discussing some of the different types of transplants and we're just going to see some of the benefits, drawbacks, and individual criteria for each of those. So there are many types of organs that can be transplanted. Some of the more common ones that you might have heard of are, for example, heart transplants, kidneys, liver, lungs, pancreas, intestines, but there can also be tissues that are transplanted. Kidneys are the most commonly transplanted organs, but they can also be, like I said, tissue transplants. So, for example, bone transplants, skin, tendons, corneas. We have not yet gotten to the point that we transplant entire eyes, but tissues of the eyes, like the corneas, can actually be transplanted, especially commonly done with older people that have something called cataracts, where their corneas become cloudy, and they can get uh, fresh corneas transplanted into their eyes. Sometimes you might not need an entire heart transplant, you might not, might just need parts of the heart, so heart valves, just the, the doors that open and close the different chambers of the heart, those can be transplanted, and veins can be moved from one part of the body to another. We'll see later on when we talk about cardiovascular disease and, cardio, and cardiovascular medicine, how vein transplants can actually be a part of what is called bypass surgery, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. So one of the interesting things about organ transplants is that some organs can actually be transplanted or some tissues can actually be transplanted from a living donor. Some of them require a non-living donor, one that is for all purposes dead but whose heart is still beating. So sometimes patients that are being kept alive by a machine who are officially brain dead but whose heart is still beating and for some transplants a non-heart beating donor is is possible so you don't have to, a heart beating donor for the for the organ to be viable although always speed is of the essence and you want to make sure that the organ gets from the donor to the patient in as quick as time as possible so for example some organs and tissues can be retrieved from live donors like for example kidneys people can donate a kidney and still live a fairly normal life because we have two kidneys and we can easily survive with just one so a kidney transplant can be done with a live donor sometimes even part of your liver you don't donate your entire liver we only have one of them but our liver has two sections or lobes and so sometimes a section of the liver or lobe can be donated and livers are amazing because they have the capability of actually regrowing the parts of the of the liver that are removed so if a lobe of a liver is removed the donor will eventually regrow that part of the liver and that small lobe that is in, that is given to the recipient can eventually grow into a full liver oftentimes when it comes to lungs with live donors it is the lobe of a lung that can be given some Organs and tissues can be retrieved from, like I said, a non-living donor. So, for example, lungs do not require a, live, a heart beating donor, but some will require that the heart be still beating when the organ is removed, and it has to very quickly go from the donor to the recipient. And so, for example, hearts, pancreas, and small intestines and bowel, the donor's heart needs to still be beating when the organs are retrieved. The survival rate of transplants will also vary depending on the type of organ that is transplanted and usually when we look at the survival rate we look at the one three and five year survival for different types of transplants and as the time progresses the survival rate for patients will decrease kidney transplants have one of the highest survival rate the first year survival rate for patients that have received a kidney is 97.2 percent of patients will survive the first year after transplant by the time that you get to the fifth year about 87.7 percent of patients have survived with the transplant and then the next one up is liver liver has the 
you know, fairly good, not as good as, as, as kidney, but a fairly good survival rate. Hearts are a little bit lower than that. One of the lowest survival rates is lung transplants. Lung transplants have a very poor survival rate. 85% uh, of patients make it through the first year, but by the time that you look at year five, only about 55% of them have survived their lung transplant. So what are the drawbacks of transplantation medicine? Why isn't this just a perfect solution? The main drawback of transplantation medicine is basically organ and tissue rejection. We talked about the immune system in our second unit, and we talked about how different body tissues have these little tiny molecules or markers called antigens, and how our bodies can produce antibodies that can recognize self and can recognize non-self. And that is true of organs. So when it comes to organs, it is highly improbable that you will ever find a donor that will have the exact same tissue markers as the patient. And so there's always a chance of rejection, of organ rejection, of the immune system recognizing that the organ that is placed in the body is not self and therefore mounting an immune response and uh, essentially attacking the organ. Organ rejection can lead to transplant failure and death if the organ is not removed. So what can we do to reduce the chance of organ and tissue rejection? And there are a couple of things that are done when it comes to transplantation medicine. The first type, and you might be aware of this if you've ever seen a movie or watched Grey's Anatomy or any kind of TV show that deals with, with medicine and might touch upon organ transplants, is that we need to make sure that we match the patient to the donor, right? Not everybody's a match. You have to find someone who's a match. And so this is called serotyping. And serotyping is the process by which the recipients are matched to the donors and you're looking for similar tissue types. Most often, siblings are the ones that are going to most likely be a match for a patient. Full siblings have the greater chances of being a match through serotyping. And the next thing is even once a match is found uh, as close as possible to the tissue type as a patient, once a transplant occurs, then the patient must then go into a regimen of immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of their lives. So the patient will have to take a whole bunch of medication that essentially drops their immune system, keeps it at low levels, and this is a lifelong thing. It is a way of trying to trick the immune system into not recognizing the organ as not belonging to the body, but essentially keeping the immune system a little bit weak. Of course, when you keep the immune system weak, not only are you having the effect of avoiding organ rejection, you also have the effect of increasing the likelihood of diseases. You increase the risk of respiratory illness, of flus, of colds, of any disease by which our immune system is busy fighting against, these are more likely to happen to people who are immune compromised. It also can lead to cancers, increased risk of cancer, and that is because cancer is avoided in part by our own immune system. A healthy immune system is constantly fighting cancer cells as they develop before they turn into tumors. With a weak immune system, people are more likely to have these cancer cells be ignored, which then can develop into tumors, and then it can turn into full-blown cancer. And unfortunately, also the the medication itself usually tend to be pretty harsh to the kidneys, so oftentimes kidney failure is an effect of these immune suppressant drugs. So transplantation medicine is not a perfect solution. The process of rejection really puts a, a big drawback to this type of medicine, but at the time right now, for a lot of people, it is the one solution that they may have it, that could increase their lifespan. Another concern, which is not on this note, is organ availability. There are just not enough organs, and there's a big, huge waiting list for people to, to get organs. So that's another concern. Let's talk about the types of transplants. First, we're going to start by looking at something called autographs. Sorry, I should have warned you, but this is a little graphic. The next slide is going to definitely be graphic because this is just pictures. The next one shows actual photographs. So autographs are basically transplants of tissues 
from a patient to themselves. So this does not involve two people. It does not involve the donor. It just involves one single patient. And obviously we're not going to be transplanting organs, but it usually involves tissues, skin, tendons, veins, and so on. A very common example of autografts is the removal of the grafting of a vein from one part of the body, usually the thigh, and grafting it into the heart, say, for example, during bypass surgery, which we're going to discuss in more detail in the next lesson. Another common example is what happens when people get skin grafts. Skin grafts are usually a treatment for burn patients when people have third degree burns in parts of their body and they need to have live living skin replace the dead and burnt skin in parts of their body, then skin grafts are used. So a graft is taken of a body part of the patient that has healthy skin, oftentimes the thigh, the buck, the buttocks, um, just an area that has clear, healthy skin that has not been burnt. Usually you don't want to take too huge a section of skin to reduce scarring to the donor side. Very often the area that needs to be covered is much larger than the healthy skin that can be donated. So what happens is the skin after it's been removed from the patient's donor site, it is put through a machine that essentially converts that skin into a mesh by puncturing it with tons and tons of tiny little holes. What this does is it makes the skin more stretchy so that it can then be stretched to cover a much wider area. And then because the skin is still alive, then the holes will fill up as the patient's body undergoes just tissue repair and mitosis happens in those skin cells and they just basically repair it. So this next slide actually shows a skin graft. And so if you're going to be grossed out by this, um, just close your eyes. So here is a fresh skin graft. You can see that there's very little skin. It's just been stretched out so that once it heals, this is not the same patient, but this is a back of a patient that has undergone many skin grafts and kind of it heals like that so you can see the places where the skin has healed. So the type of transplant that you're most likely familiar with are called allografts. Allografts are basically the transplants in which you have a donor, you have a patient, and they're genetically different. Sometimes it might be a complete stranger, sometimes it might be a sibling, and the donor donates an organ and the patient receives it. This is the type of transplantation where rejection can occur. With autografts, you don't have rejection because you're not going to reject your own body tissues. With allografts, you can have rejection because these are not your own body tissues. This belongs to a person, uh, some other genetically different person than you. Oftentimes with, uh, with allografts, you can have a living donor, like for example with kidney transplants, which are the most common type of transplant. An interesting thing about kidney transplants, unless the cause of the, the reason why the transplant is needed is cancer, in which case the kidneys are removed because it would be cancerous. The kidneys are actually not removed. So a patient that receives a donor kidney usually ends up with three kidneys. The two original kidneys are just stay there and a new healthy kidney that is added to the patient. An interesting thing with liver transplant, which is another live donor transplant, is that, like I said before, a portion of the liver can be transplanted and the donor will regrow their liver and the patient will also regrow the part of the liver that is placed in their body. So livers can regenerate and you can end up with, you know, two healthy livers from one. The next level of or type of transplant, which is not very common, is what we call isografts. Isografts can only happen with identical twins, so it's not that commonly done. This is a transplant of tissue or organ between two genetically identical twins, so non not fraternal, but genetically identical twins. And in this particular case, it gets its own category because even though the, the transplant happens between two different people, there's absolutely no chance of rejection because identical twins happen to have the exact same tissue type. Xenografts are even more rare, but they are a category. Xenografts are when transplants happen between different species. Xenografts that have been done for humans have involved pigs. Uh, or baboons as well. Uh, these are extremely dangerous 
because there's an increased risk of both rejection as well as disease. Now, imagine how likely we are to reject the organ from another human. We are more likely to reject the organ of a completely different species. Xenografts are not prohibited in Canada, but there has never been a clinical trial involving a xenograft transplantation that has been approved by Health Canada. So this is not something that is typically done in Canadian hospitals. Another category of transplants is something called split transplant. And a split transplant is when one organ is shared between two patients, two recipients. So this is most commonly done with, say, for the liver. If, say, for example, there is a liver that becomes available for donation and you have both an adult and a child that match the tissue type as that liver, then both of them can receive part of that liver. The one patient, the adult, can receive the bigger lobe and the child can receive the smaller lobe. And so this is a good way of sort of maximizing the availability of organs if you can split a transplant that way. Domino transplants are the most interesting one. And so there's a three types of domino transplants that I'm going to discuss with you. So let's start with discussing domino heart transplants. A domino heart, heart transplant is an interesting procedure and is done just in a very specific circumstance. And this is when you have a patient who has cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a disease that mainly, not, although not exclusively, but mainly affects the lungs. And one of the ways that cystic fibrosis patients have of extending their lifespan is by getting a lung transplant. Lung transplants, as you learned earlier, have a very low survival rate. And However, the survival rate for lung transplants is increased if you don't just receive lungs, but you receive both the lungs and heart of the same donor. So receiving both a heart and lung combo is going to increase the chances of a cystic fibrosis patients who already has a lot of other medical conditions uh, is going to increase their chances of surviving and extending the longevity of that transplant. And so cystic fibrosis patients have perfectly healthy hearts. The disease does not affect their heart, but they do have a higher chance of survival if they get a, both a heart and lung combo. So let's say they find a donor who is diseased, whose heart and lungs are available to be transplanted. And so they're going to give that heart and lung to the cystic fibrosis patients. It would be a complete waste to remove a healthy heart from the cystic fibrosis patients when heart transplants are so hard to, to come by because there's such a good uh, such a big waiting list. And so what they do is that then stat domino the surgery so that the heart from the cystic fibrosis patient, which is still healthy, is then given to a second patient. So a second patient that only needs a heart, has perfectly healthy lungs, will receive the healthy heart from the cystic fibrosis patient because the cystic fibrosis patient is receiving both a heart and lung combination. So this is a domino transplant because these three, these two patients are basically, their surgeries are happening simultaneously because as one organ is removed from one body, then it moves to the next one and then it moves to the next one, kind of like a domino effect. Another interesting domino transplant is domino liver transplants. So this is a procedure in which a liver with a metabolic disorder, so this is a diseased liver, a liver that is that has a condition, a metabolic disorder, a very specific one, uh, is removed from one patient. And that liver is then transplanted into a second patient. And then the original patient who had the diseased liver removed gets a fresh new liver from a donor. Now, this might seem crazy. Why are we giving diseased livers to people who need a fresh liver? And then getting the person whose diseased liver is removed, getting a fresh new liver. So this is not a typical transplant that is done, but it is actually an ingenious way of maximizing the availability of livers for a very specific type of condition. And that is for a disease called familial amyloid polyneuropathy, or FAP. So FAP is a genetic disorder. It's an autosomal disease, so it means that a patient has a 50% chance of 
passing it on to their children and f having inherited from their parents. And so what FIP does is it creates a mutated gene that provides instructions for a protein that is mainly produced in the liver. And this protein is important for the proper transfer of vitamin A and a hormone called thyroxine. Now, people with FAP are going to produce a mutated protein. And the mutant protein forms these deposits called amyloid deposits in tissues, mainly in the nerves, in the heart, in the kidneys, and in the eyes. And these deposits will, will build up slowly over time, but will start to damage those organs. And eventually symptoms may start, but they don't start early in life because it usually takes years of damage for symptoms to be recognized. So for some patients, the first symptoms may present in their 20s. For some others, you know, a little bit later. Um, some may not present symptoms until their 80s, depending on the patient. But after the onset of symptoms, usually the damage has been severe enough once the symptoms are present that the patient, if the disease continues and the amyloid deposits continue to build up, the patient might have maybe 15 to 20 years of life left because those deposits are going to be, you know, be eventually lead to death. By the time the symptoms are recognized, enough damage has happened that the patient usually might have only 15 to 20 more years. So let's say you have a patient, uh, Betty, who's 51 years old. She now has, the, she's developed symptoms of FAP. Um, she went for treatment. They just determined, yep, you have familial amyloid polyneuropathy. You, your symptoms have started, which means that you have maybe 15 to 20 years left of life because the amyloid deposits are going to continue to, to accumulate and eventually is going to lead to multiple organ failure. You know, So she has a death sentence on top of her. The only way to prevent de her death and to stop the deterioration of her body parts and her tissues is to remove her liver. Her liver is poisoning her. Her liver is creating this mutant protein that is causing the damage. And so she needs a liver transplant. And she gets it. A pa patient A dies. It's a diseased life donor. She gets that patient A's healthy liver. And so at that point, Betty, patient B, gets a new liver. This liver does not have the mutated protein, so this liver is producing healthy amounts of the of the of the protein. Whatever deterioration to her to her organs is stopped, and so her symptoms will not get worse. She definitely has extended her life. She might have another thirty or forty years left because her her condition is not going to worsen because her liver is no longer poisoning her with this faulty protein. But what about her liver? Her liver has been removed, and it has been creating these mutated proteins. So we have Michelle Martin. She is 70 years old. She needs a liver transplant. Maybe Michelle Martin only has a couple of years left to live. Unfortunately, Michelle Martin is not going to get a liver. The transplant list is extremely high. There is thousands of people requiring livers. There's not enough, enough donor livers to go around. And at her age, she is at a, a low priority for getting a liver transplant. However, she can get Betty's liver. Betty's liver will eventually kill Michelle, but not for another 20 to 30 years. Michelle's already 70 years old, so it's fine. She can get this liver that might kill Michelle if she were to live another 30 years, but that's 30 years longer than she was going to live with her old liver anyway, and nobody was going to give her a liver transplant. So this is a situation in which a dominant liver transplant is it's fair use because even though patient C is receiving an unhealthy or liver a liver with a metabolic disease, um, the effects of that disease are not going to really impact Michelle's lifespan. I mean, an unhealthy liver would never be given to a child because then that would be basically, you know, putting a death sentence on that child, like a limited lifespan. But a 70-year-old woman likely does not have 30 more years. And so that liver lasting her that long, you know, would be a miracle. So that's 
another type of domino transplant. A third type of domino transplant is kidney transplants. Domino kidney transplants are actually a little bit different than the previous ones because in the previous ones you saw an organ moved from one patient to another to another. In this particular case, it's, it's all about organization and organizing patients and recipients in a way that is going to increase the likelihood that people are going to be getting matching livers, uh, sorry, matching kidneys. So this is a process by which a group of incompatible donor-to-recipient pairs can be matched with other incompatible donor-to-recipient pairs in order to basically get everybody a matching kidney. So let's say we have recipient A. She is sick. She needs a new, a new kidney. Her best friend has offered her a kidney. She went and got tested. It's not a match. The same is true with recipient B and their donor and her donor is like her sister wants to give her a kidney, it's not a match. And every single pair that you see in this picture is basically a pair of people that you have someone who needs a kidney, someone who wants to give them their kidney, but they're not a match. Well, if you play your cards right, doctors can then figure out a way that they can match donors to recipients so that every single recipient receives a kidney even though it is not from their specific donor. And so it's a, it's a logistics game. It requires a lot of work and organization, but it can be done. There are approximately 100,000 people on the, on the disease donor kidney transplant wait list. Many of them are waiting 5 to 10 years before their name is called to receive a kidney. 5,000 people die every year waiting for a transplant, and another 5,000 are removed from the list because they're no longer healthy enough to receive a transplant. So this is an alternative to the situation. When a patient cannot find a donor that matches their tissue type, sometimes the system can work in a way so that we can increase the number of transplantation patients that are matched to compatible kidneys by just being creative. And dominant kidney transplants is a great way of being creative. So there was one situation that happened um, back in 2012, where a, pay, a donor showed up to a hospital and said, hey, I want to donate my kidney. So it started with Mr. Ruzamenti, this guy right here. He was the good Samaritan that started the chain reaction. He went to a hospital and said, I want to donate my kidney. Um, I don't have anyone to donate it to, but if you can match me with someone who needs a kidney, you can have my kidney. And so doctors work together in many hospitals, 30 kidneys, 17 hospitals, 11 states, in order to maximize that Good Samaritan's contribution by basically dominoing all of these patients' kidney to transplants. Doctors worked tirelessly to sort of work everything out. Everybody's surgery had to be done simultaneously in order to get all these kidneys to all these patients. In the end, 30 kidneys were removed and transplanted. 60 patients were involved, uh, 17 hospitals, 11 states, and one Good Samaritan. On that pleasant note, we will end this lesson. Part two of this lesson will focus on the future of transplantation medicine and alternatives to organ and tissue transplants. Talk to you soon.